thankful for the Lord and I can't help but think and I've been thinking about it a lot of days. Sister Carrie Embry, we all know what she's going through, suffering from a brain aneurysm and a couple of different strokes. And through this all, I've been kicking myself because I haven't been able to get emotional. But I haven't told anyone this, not even my family, but from the very first moment that I heard that she was suffering from the brain aneurysm, just such a calm and a peace came over me. Because God was just saying to me, she's going to be pulled through this. You know, I haven't told anyone that. But I'm thankful that we serve an on-time God, even through the things that we're going through, through the many trials and tribulations. He knows right where we're at. He knows right what we need at any given moment. I'm thankful for the Lord that he's mindful for of us. And we just love him.
know, just take care of her and help her out of this. And right now they're back there talking to her. And you know, right now she may not be talking their ears off, but she called on her own. She wanted to see them. She's answering questions and she's smiling. And it was just so amazing to see how the Lord's moving. And I'm just so happy to be back in the house of the Lord. Me and Brother Jairus are the youth pastors here at Brother Miller's church. And we hope that these lives are encouraging everybody. But I wanted to just say for a minute to our youth from here, at PHT, young people, we miss you so much. We've been doing these Zooms a couple times a week, and it's been so good to see them all there and, you know, listen to them getting involved and um, into our devotional time and our Sunday school lesson interacting. But we can't wait to be with you here in service, praising the Lord together and worshiping and being able to really get it all together again. But the Lord's got it, and, you know, take this time to grow. I heard somebody on a video yesterday on Facebook, and they were talking about physical appearance, but he was on there, you know, and he was talking about you know, you need to be motivated during this quarantine to get fit and not get fat. You know, and yeah, he was talking about, you know, all of us sitting on the couch eating way too many cookies because we're so bored. But he was talking about, you know, he's like, it's the time to get fit. You know, your excuses you all had before, you're not too busy. We, you know, we know you ain't doing nothing but sitting on your couch. But seriously, I start thinking in a spiritual sense, young people, this is your time. You know, we're always like, oh, I'm too busy. You know, I've got school. I've got things I'm doing after school. I've got this and that. I'm here and there. You know, I'm too busy to fast. I'm too busy to pray anymore. I'm too busy to read my Bible. But this is the time in the Lord to get fed and not fat. <laughs> not to feel like, you know, oh, I'm not going to church. I'm just going to slack off. You know, youth camp season, you know, all this will be over. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll get better when I go to camp. I'll get excited when I go to camp. But this is a perfect time to throw away the excuses. Get a hold of God. Use this time to separate yourself. And say, God, this is the time that I'm really going to grow and I'm going to take advantage of these moments to get along with you and to make something happen in my life. And we hope that you guys are staying encouraged and we love you so much. Hey, Amen. It's so good to be here tonight. Thankful for the opportunity to preach. I want to just uh, reiterate that to our young people how much we love and miss you. During this time, we wish so bad that we could be with y'all in normal services, but it has been so great to get to uh, be a part of these lives and to get to be a part of some Zoom calls that we've done with y'all. If you're listening to this and you're a young person, just remember Thursday nights at 7 o'clock and Saturday at noon is when we do the Zooms. And please do your best to log on and take part in those. It's just such a great encouragement during this time to, to have that opportunity to, to connect with one another. And just so uh, looking forward to that every uh, time we do that. And uh, I've just enjoyed the presence of the Lord. I was thinking while Brother Quentin was singing and while the other ones were singing, I'll tell you what, if this had been normal church, I think I'd about just ready, uh, shouted it out, not even got to the preaching. Unfortunately, with the church, there's only about 10 of us that we're doing Facebook Live. Uh, it's a little harder to have a shout down. Uh, maybe I could have still started it, Brother Miller, got yeah. myself out of this, but I'm thankful for the opportunity. I will try to look at the camera. But I am a horrible person when it comes to maintaining one side of uh, focus. So if you're watching and you see me looking all over the place, forgive me. I will try my best to look front and center at the camera. Amen. Uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter number 27. Again, it's so good to just be here in church and just to feel the presence of the Lord. If you want to turn in Acts chapter 27. When Brother Miller had asked me to preach, I, I felt the Lord, there was a, a message I've been uh, wondering when I would preach it that the Lord had laid on my heart several months back. And it just seemed like a fitting time when I went into prayer and just trusting the Lord here tonight. Acts chapter number 27, just going to get straight into the Word of God here. And I'm going to read a, a few verses and skip around just a little bit to, to give us some background on this story. Acts chapter 27, starting in verse number 9. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt, and much damage, not only of the landing and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship, more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And when the south wind blew, skipping down to verse number 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachbadon. 
And when neither sun, skipping down to verse number 20, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appear, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. And I want to preach tonight for just a little while on revival after the storm. When we look at this story, it's important to realize what's happening in this chapter, in the preceding chapters, to really understand what's going on. The Apostle Paul, he had been imprisoned on a false accusation that he, had, he was causing rebellion and that he was polluting the temple. That happened back a few chapters before in the book of Acts. He had been thrown in jail. He had been found innocent, in fact, by the governor Felix and then the person that replaced him, the governor Festus and, and King Agrippa. All of them had, had saw that Paul was innocent, that he didn't deserve to be in prison. But yet he was still falsely imprisoned and awaiting trial in Rome. And that's where we find Paul at now in our story in the text today. Is Paul is still a prisoner and he's on a ship heading towards Rome. There's a centurion that's watching him and the other prisoners. And they stop at this, uh, this harbor and they're considering going on. But they know it's a dangerous time of the year to sail. And Paul in godly wisdom warns the centurion and he warns the captain of the ship that it's not a good idea to go ahead and to try to sail and make it on to their, their next stop as they head towards Rome. That there's going to be a great a loss of, of the cargo of the ship and also a great loss of life if they proceed on this journey. And Paul tries to warn them, but unfortunately, the Bible tells us in verse number 11, nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Unfortunately, sometimes you can get caught up in storms and in situations that are no fault of your own, that you didn't do anything to cause, that you didn't have any part in Paul didn't want to go on this trip. He was a prisoner, but he still got caught in the middle of the storm. And when we look at the world around us today and all of the turmoil and all the things happening with this virus going around, none of us caused it. None of us would have chosen it. But nevertheless, we are still in the storm dealing with this COVID-19 virus. Verse number 14 of Acts 27 says, But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. And I got to looking that up, and the modern term for Eurachlodon uh, is a gregale. And a, it's a strong and cold wind that blows from the northeast in the western and central Mediterranean region, mainly in winter. It's a wind that can get so strong that it has hurricane force winds and endangers shipping in that region. In fact, in 1555, waves from one of these storms were so high and so devastating that on the Isle of Malta, 600 people lost their lives by drowning. That's how bad these storms get even still up into this day. And in Paul's time, we know that reading through the, the text here, the storm that they find themselves in. And verse number 20 tells us that when neither sun nor stars in many days appear and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. And I'll tell you what, if you go through cloudy days in life just in general, it'll get you down. You're longing for the sunshine. You're longing to see brighter weather. But can you imagine being on a boat, being in the middle of the ocean, trapped on a storm, and you can't even see the sun, and you can't even see the stars. All you can see all around you is the storm and the trial and what you're going through. And you don't know how you're going to make it out. And that's where these men found themselves on this ship. There was no hope, it says in verse number 20, that they should be saved. They saw no way out of the storm. No road back to normal sailing. They were literally trapped in a cycle of turmoil. And in our world, we can feel the same way at times. Whether it's from something like this virus or whether it's just life, sometimes we feel trapped and like there's no way out. There's no way back to smooth sailing. There's no way back to the sunny skies and the bright days that we long for so much. And all hope that things will go back to normal anytime soon just start fading away. Yeah, come on. But fortunately, that's not where this story ends. Verse number 21, Paul, after a long abstinence, stood forth in the midst 
to them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And I got to looking up what that long abstinence was talking about. And when I looked the word abstinence up in a Bible dictionary, it literally meant to abstain from food, to fast. It was a loss of appetite as if you hadn't been eating. And when you think about it in the natural, food is something that is essential. It's essential to our lives. You can't make it long without food and keep your strength up. And if you can imagine these men on this boat, what this was saying is they have lost their appetite. There had been a long abstinence. They had already given up all hope and they were just settling into the despair. And I've actually heard before that when people are getting ready to die, they lose their appetite and food can become repulsive to them. And that's what had happened with these men on this ship. They had completely lost their appetite for food. And food is essential in the natural life. But I got to thinking spiritually, the bread of life is essential. Spiritually, the gospel of Jesus Christ is essential. And when we look at our nation today, when we look at our country, you can say we're dealing with a loss of appetite. People no longer want the things of God like they once did. They no longer hunger after righteousness. They no longer desire to be filled with the Spirit of God. But they want to do things their own way. And what they don't realize is that they are dying on the inside. They are killing themselves spiritually. They are starving themselves. And they are going to die from starvation when it comes to spiritual things. God is essential for the Christian. You can't make it without Him. You can't make it without reading the Bible. You can't make it without prayer. You can't make it without a desire to seek for the things of God. But I believe God also can change things and He can send storms our way that sometimes have to wake us up and cause us to look at our priorities and realize that we need to refocus and reevaluate the priorities that we have set in our life. Yeah. Going on to verse number 22, Paul said, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. As a church, we should be of good cheer. As a church, we are not going to lose. Our nation and even acclaimed Christianity itself may turn their back on God. They may have lost their appetite for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But as a church, we can still be hungry. As a church, we can still seek after Him. And we can still have revival. Our God can turn things around. We know the God that we serve. We know the God that stands by us in the middle of our storms. There's a song that says he's the master of the sea. We know the God that walks on the stormy seas. He says, peace be still. And the winds and the seas obey him. We know the God that is the master of the storm. And his name is Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's not any other name, but it's the name of Jesus. Yeah. And the great thing is, is it doesn't just stop with getting out of the storm alive by the skin of our teeth. It doesn't just stop with barely making it. But there is a revival after the storm. You see, after the storm and the danger, after the shipwreck, when the Bible says that they cast themselves into the sea and some made it on broken pieces of the ship, and not one person in that shipwreck perished. They all made it safely to land. And they came to the island of Melita. Now this island was hundreds of miles from the best of my research away from their intended destination. They were way off course. They were way off track. But Paul and the rest of them were right where God wanted them to be. Paul was right where Jesus had in store for him to be in the next chapter. We find them on that Isle of Melita. And in Acts chapter 28, verse number 3, the Bible tells us, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on a the fire, 
there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And here you are, you're cold and you're wet. You just survived a shipwreck. And Paul, he's not taking it easy. He's not having other people do all the work. But he's going up and he's building the fire. He's going out and he's getting wood for the fire. And as Christians, right now, we can't afford to take it easy. During this time when the rest of the world is shut down, we don't need to be cowering in fear. We don't need to be shutting down ourselves. But we need to be planning. We need to be working for God, building sticks, getting the fire hotter and hotter. So that revival can burn bright yes. in our land. And that's what we find Paul doing. But then a viper comes out of the heat and fastens on his hand. Amen. When you try to do a work for God, when you try to build up the fire of revival, you Amen. can bet that the devil is going to attack you. That the devil is going to come after you with everything he got he has. He'll try to bring you down any way that he can. But I like what Paul did in verse number five. He simply shook off the beast into the fire. And the Bible says that he felt no harm. The devil could not stop him. The devil could not hurt him. And when he first got bit, all of the people of this island, of the island of Melina, they thought amongst themselves and said, this man has to be a murderer or some terrible person. That the judgment of God is upon him, even though he escaped the shipwreck, he is now going to die by the snake biting his hand. But they watched and he didn't die. They watched and there wasn't even any signs that he had been bit. Verse number six says, how be it they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. Now we know that Paul was not a God, that he was only a man just like you and me. But this was flaming or fanning the flame of revival in these people's minds. They realized there's something different about this person. They didn't understand it. They knew he should have been dead, but he was alive. And then Paul got to be a witness to him. He got to share the gospel of Christ. And verse number seven says, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief men of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hand on him and healed him. You see, it was the snake biting him that caused the people to realize there's something different about him that caused Publius, the chief man of the island, to call Paul to his house. And when his father lay sick and died, he remembered, Paul has a power I don't understand. There's something different about him that I don't understand, but I want Paul to pray for my father. And God miraculously healed his father. And verse number nine says, so when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. What this is saying in verse number 9 is there was a revival that took place on the island of Melita. And it all started with a storm called Eropidon that took Paul and the ship he was on way off course. You see, without the storm, there would have been no revival. Without the storm, they would have never been on this island. There would have been no healing. There would have been no salvation come to these people Amen. without the storm. Sometimes we go through the storms and we can't wait to get out. And I don't know of anybody that likes to be in a storm. But I'm thankful I serve a God that can work in the middle of the storm. No matter what you're going through, God is able to work for you tonight and to help you come out of the storm with a revival fire in your heart. Yes. You might not understand why you have to go through the storm. 
Your life's been thrown off track and you don't understand it. But you are right where God wants you to be. You might be suffering financially. You've lost your job or you don't know what to do. You've got a loved one that's sick. But you can call on God and you can depend on him in the middle of your storm. You can depend on him no matter what the circumstances are. No matter how bad it looks. If all hope that you're going to be saved is lost. He's still able to save you tonight. There is coming a revival after this storm. I believe it with all of my heart that when this is all over, when our church doors are open like normal again, there's going to be such a revival. Break out among our churches. Break out among our people and our nation. Yes. There is a revival after the storm. It's a personal revival that's going to begin deep down in our hearts as we start to turn and seek God. All the distractions, all the busyness of life for a lot of people have been done away with. Now you can still fill that time with something else, but I'm trusting that Christians all over the country are going to start praying and fasting and seeking God like never before for a revival that will change America, that will change our world. I was thinking, and I'm about to close here, I don't want to go on too long, but uh, like they mentioned with Sister Carrie Embry from our church being sick, during this time, it's very hard for, for anybody that has a family member that's sick, whether it's with the COVID-19 virus or any other illness, because you can't go into the hospital with them in most circumstances. They're not allowing any visitors. And her husband was unable to go in. Brother Miller wasn't able to go in and pray with Sister Carrie. But what we did as a church is we said a day and we all went out there in our cars and we had a prayer service. I didn't get to go. Unfortunately, I was at work. But we had a prayer service for Sister Carrie out in the parking lot of the hospital. And on Facebook, one of the nurses from the hospital had taken a picture. Might have even been a video. I don't know for sure. But she had taken a picture of everybody out praying in their cars. And because of that, multiple hospitals contacted our pastor, Brother Miller, asking if our church would come by and do the same thing at their hospital. Would come and stand outside our cars in their parking lot and pray over the hospital and pray over the sick people in the hospital that the Lord would heal them. There is revival coming out of the storm. God is already moving and he's already working. And if you'll just seek his face, if you'll trust him, yes. he's going to bring us out. And we're not going to come into church half dead, barely able to make it all need to fall down on the altar because we've done so horrible this month that we haven't had normal church. Oh, but we're going to come in with a shout. We're going to enter into his gates with praise and into his courts with thanksgiving. Oh, and we're going to shine bright for the world to see. Now, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. But God will bring you out. You're not going to die, but you're going to live and you're going to have revival. There is revival after this storm. Whatever you're facing, God is greater. He's greater than the storm. He's greater than this virus. He's greater than your job loss. He's greater than your sickness. He's greater than it all. They're going to sing a song about revival. And if you're watching this online, I want to encourage you to just lift your hands and let the devil know, devil, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. And I'm going to live on fire for God. If you're watching now, just raise your hands and rejoice with them as they sing here tonight.
study revival? I really do. I'm looking for a, a Holy Ghost revival right after this storm, like our you pastor preached right there. Amen. That was a powerful message. It really was. So you look for it. God's going to give us a great revival. I believe it with all of my heart. I thank God for the message tonight. I felt the Spirit of the Lord in every song. So uh, we want you to encourage you to listen to us uh, every Sunday, if you will, at 11 o'clock. And we're up Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock. We have a couple full-time evangelists out of our church. So we're going to try to get them to preach for us on a, a couple of these Tuesdays. we got Brother Quentin and Brother David Eldridge, both of them full-time preachers out of this church. And we look forward to hearing both of them on a Tuesday. So we hope we've been a blessing to you tonight. And I felt touched. I felt a personal touch in my heart. I've been believing God for revival. But after that message, I really believe it's going to happen soon. Thank God. Send revival, Lord. Hey, I don't want to take too much time, but just uh, uh, two weeks ago Sunday, we had a young man come up to me and he said, I felt something in this service. We was outside, but he came up and he felt the Lord in that service. And I didn't even know it, but this week we had sinners that drove up and were sitting in their cars while the singing and the preaching was going on. And they told me later, said, I felt conviction in my heart. And I felt like the Lord wanted to uh, me to pray and said, I did pray in my car. So the Lord heard it. I might not have been there I, I, to see that myself because we was having a service and they were in the cars, but God saw that. And I'll tell you this, the Lord sees you now. Even though you're not in church with us or not in a church physically, the Lord sees you now. So if I was you tonight, I would ask the Lord to come into my heart and ask him to save me if I wouldn't save He will. He will. And to every saint of God, I want to encourage you to look up. There's a revival on the way. Praise God. Hallelujah.